and I would like to call this meeting to order. Will the clerk please take roll call attendance? Madam Chair. Here. Senator Archambault. Senator Raptakis. Senator Burke. Senator Burke. Here. Senator Oyer. Here. Here. Senator Lombardi. Here. Senator Casada. Senator Rogers. Whip De La Cruz. Here. There are five members present. You have a quorum. Thank you. We have six solemnization of marriage bills from the House up for hearing or consideration. I would like to bundle these bills for consideration. They are House Bill 6137 by Whip Kazarian, House Bill 6138 by Rep Solomon, House Bill 6158 by Speaker Shikachi, House Bill 6176 by Rep Potter, House Bill 6177 by Rep Ackerman, and finally House Bill 6178 by Speaker Shikachi. If there are no questions from committee members, do I hear a motion to pass all six bills? Motion made by... Senator Oyer and seconded by Senator Lombardi. Mr. Clark, will you take a roll call vote, please? Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Senator Burke. Senator, Senator Burke. Burke. <laughs> Senator Oyer. Yes. Senator Lombardi. Yes. And Whip De La Cruz. Yes. There are five in the affirmative and none in the negative. Thank you. And I believe Senator um, Archambault is with us right now. Uh, if you could please mock him present. And would you like to be recorded in the affirmative on the solemnization of bills that we just passed? And uh, that's a yes, and it doesn't change the outcome. Our, again, our committee has another full agenda today. We'll be hearing seven bills in keeping with existing virtual protocol. For this committee, I would ask for a motion to hold all seven of these bills before us for further study. Motion made by Senator Oyer and seconded by Senator Lombardi. Mr. Clark, will you take a roll call vote, please? Madam Chair. Yes. Senator Archambault. Yes. Senator Burke. Yes. Senator Oyer. Yes. Senator Lombardi. Yes. Whip De La Cruz. Yes. There's six in the affirmative and none in the negative. Uh, thank you. I see that uh, Senator Rogers is now present. Uh, if you could be mocked present, uh, would you like to be recorded in the affirmative on passing of the solemnization of marriages bills? Yes, please. And on hold for further study? Yes, please. Okay, and it does not change the outcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, in an effort to utilize both the sponsors and public's time more efficiently while conducting these hearings virtually, I will ask each of the sponsors, if they're present, to introduce and explain their bill. Upon conclusion of the sponsor's introduction and explanation, we'll then take public testimony on each of these bills. Uh, this way, if a member of the public has signed up to testify on one or more bill, they may do so at that time. Okay, let's see. The first bill up for introduction is by Senator Coleman, Senate Bill Number 126. I, uh, Senator Coleman could not join us th uh, this afternoon. I do have the House sponsor, Rep. Potter, who will be testifying on the bill, but just uh, for the sake of introduction, this act uh, relates to health and safety, anatomical gifts. It requires that all applicants for driver's license and registry issued identification cards automatically become organ donors unless they execute a declination card. Um, do we have Rep. Potter on the phone? Welcome to the committee, um, Representative Potter. I believe that you're going to be speaking uh, on Senate Bill number 126 as you are the House sponsor of uh, the matching bill. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Coyne, members of the committee. Um, I'll start by saying the Senate certainly has good timing on this bill because April is National Donate Life Month which uh, hopefully helps to bring more awareness to the gift of organ donation and hopefully encourage more people uh, to participate and uh, improve our donation rates. 
So it's good timing, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to the committee about the bill uh, and the importance of it. So let me begin by saying that the intent of this bill um, is twofold. One is to normalize the process of organ donation, and two is to streamline the process for how people enroll to be an organ donor. So you might ask, why do we need to normalize the process? Well, unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation and stigma around the idea of being an organ donor. Um, oftentimes, when I've spoken to people, uh, you might hear something saying that uh, they're afraid to be an organ donor because they believe that um, in the event of a tragic accident, their life might not be saved by emergency personnel, which, of course, is not true. But more importantly, to streamline the process of how people enroll. So um, currently, there are um, a number of studies that have come out to indicate that between 90 to 95% of the general population would like to be an organ donor if they were ever put in that position. However, in Rhode Island, we are only enrolling around 48% of people. And 98% of all enrollments happen at the DMZ. So just simply based on those figures and how much of a discrepancy there is between people that want to be an organ donor versus people who are enrolling, uh, I personally believe this is a process that certainly warrants and needs a lot of improvement. Now, I think it's really crucial to look at this bill in both the local context as well as the national context. Uh, because nationally, we have over 107,000 people who are currently waiting on a transplant list. Um, the vast majority of those people are people who are, are in need of a kidney specifically. So out of that 107,000, over 93,000 people are in need of a kidney. Locally, uh, there are over 6,200 patients throughout New England uh, who are currently registered on the list and eligible to receive a transplant, and almost 5,000 of those people are in need of a kidney. So clearly uh, a lot of people who are really in need, really suffering, um, and a lot that we can do to improve the process. So I'll tell you in full disclosure, um, the opposition to this concept generally, um, which comes from the organ procurement organization that facilitates organ donations through our area uh, is really rooted in a belief that our cultural dynamics in America are such that if people uh, believe that they're being forced into doing something, then they will otherwise uh, rebel against it and you're actually going to end up with less people uh, who donate. I've seen one study... Um, Again, in full disclosure, I've had a number of conversations with uh, the organ procurement organization before I submitted this bill to really kind of get a broader understanding of how, uh, you know, we could really improve the process here locally. And the one study that kept coming up was indicating that somewhere um, we would lose basically a net difference of 4% of total donations if America turned into a quote-unquote uh, opt-out model. Um, however, when I looked at that number in that one particular study where, you know, we're, we're typically getting around 70% of people that actually can be an organ donor were able to facilitate that because their next of kin are contacted at the time of uh, that difficult decision. Um, and the study would indicate, again, about a net difference of 4%. But when I compare that 4% to again, a figure of 90 to 95% of people that would want to be an organ donor versus 48% that were enrolling. Um, I just can't think that that, you know, marginal speculative difference could really make up for that vast discrepancy. Um, there were a number of studies that have come out to show that this kind of system would really pay dividends and be very, very beneficial. Uh, there are a number of countries that already do this including Spain, which has uh, a higher functioning, better result uh, than we have in America. Uh, there was one study by 
the, univer- the University of Pennsylvania back in 2017, I believe, that indicated that having a better functioning system could produce up to 28,000 more organs a year. Uh, and to give you some context, last year we had a total of 39,000 transplants nationally. Um, so th- there's, there's just a big upside to uh, maybe if you want to refer to it as testing a pilot program here in the state of Rhode Island to see if this would really improve not only the enrollment rate but the ultimate donation rate. Um, and, and that's really the, uh, the origin of the, uh, of the bill and, and what founded the rationale for, uh, for introducing it. So um, I'm certainly happy to get into uh, much greater detail if anybody has any questions, but I'm happy to answer any of those questions or expand on any of the points uh, for anyone on the committee. Thank you, and I, Rep. Again, Potter. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Sure. Um, do any committee members have any questions of Rep. Potter? Yes, Senator Rogers. Senator Rogers has a question for you, Rep. Thank you, Chair. Uh, not so much a question. I, you know, I'm very cautious on opt-out issues. To me, it's almost, I, I've seen it done in, in, in other areas, and it's, it's cost me money because I didn't get the opt-out option. I didn't call and say, hey, I don't want this anymore. Uh, I know you're probably not going to like this word, but to me, this almost feels like trickery. Uh, I think the better way of doing it is through public relations and possibly having the people at the registry of motor vehicles uh, as a requirement of getting your license. Oh, and by the way, would you like to be an organ donor? Just like when I go to a gas station, would you like to give to this thing? And that helps out when I pull up through a McDonald's. Or would you like to uh, take the, ch- the the change and round up and use it? I just think uh, there's an air of trickery in this, and I, and I know that's not the intent, but I think you may get a lot, a lot of people that, Wind up not realizing you have to opt out of something. Don't check the boxes. I know when I go to the registry of motor vehicles, there's a lot of boxes that I don't fill out. And the little lady takes her yellow card and she's or her yellow marker and she starts going through a whole bunch of things that I didn't see. And, and I'm nervous in the registry of the motor vehicles as, as it is. So I, I, I think the intent's good, but I think it's uh, almost like I said, I don't want to keep falling back to it, but a, a form of trickery that some people may not realize they're organ donors, may not want to be organ donors, and by default, by not opting out, opting out, become organ donors. So uh, that's just my statement, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rogers. Any other committee members have any questions of Rep. Potter? Thank you very much, Rep. Potter, for joining us this evening, and uh, thank you for the explanation on the bill. Uh, at this Absolutely. time... Here, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, can I just respond briefly to Senator Rogers, because I might be able to address some of his concerns. Uh, Rep., uh, you may briefly, but we have a very long agenda this evening. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Senator, I would just say I, I appreciate the point, and it's been made, uh, made clear to me already. However, the process that you described is actually what we currently have, right? So we already have uh, people at the DMV that are asking people, would you like to be an organ donor? And I think that's what actually attributes to that discrepancy of, again, the, the broad public support for people who have the intent where they want to be an organ donor versus the very small amount of people that we're enrolling. And when we talk about the, the, the cost, um, you know, one thing I, I do want to share is that uh, what really informed me to, to work on this issue was health care costs. Uh, my partner is a dialysis patient. She has a genetic kidney disease. She's been on dialysis for a number of years waiting for a kidney transplant. And when you talk about what we pay for, uh, one thing that we all pay for is Medicare treatment. And uh, Medicare is billed for her to do dialysis herself at home without a doctor, without a nurse, herself, to the tune of $35,000 per month. So this is a major drain on our health care system broadly, but again, this is really in alignment with uh, what the, the public sentiment is. And if you do read the bill, there's a number of precautions in there to make sure that these signs and this notice is really posted. We don't want anybody to, to be uh, tricked into it. We do want to have people informed. And again, it goes back to the heart of, of really normalizing what organ donation is. And uh, I'd be, in the interest of time, so I'd also be happy to um, speak to any of the com- committee members after the fact, too, if anybody wants to expand on any of that. And uh, again, Chairwoman, I thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rep. Potter. I believe Senator De La Cruz has a question. So I, uh, I have to say, I've, I've been driving since 16 years old, and I don't ever recall uh, a moment at the DMV where they asked me if I wanted to be an organ donor. 
Um, so I don't think that's actually commonplace at the DMV. And perhaps maybe Senator Rogers is correct that we implement a policy where um, it's simple as an ask, where um, maybe there are a large number of rounders that want to donate their organs. It's obviously and certainly a very good cause. Um, I heard that uh, somewhere mentioned that there was a poll that about 80% of Rhode Islanders support this, but I don't see the poll in my packet, so I'd like to see uh, these numbers, um, if, if you do have that poll. Um, again, it's a great cause, uh, but there is a lot of opposition, including the New England Organ Donor um, Organization. So uh, it just gives me a little bit of pause, want to research this and, um, and go forward from there. Thank you, Whip De La Cruz, and perhaps uh, the representative can get us that um, that survey, uh, and we can present that to you at a later date. Thank you again for joining us, and at this time, I would like to recognize Senator Quesada, who is present. Uh, Senator, would you like to be recorded in the affirmative on the votes to pass the solemnization of marriages? Senator Quesada. please. Uh, you are present and would you like to be recorded in the affirmative on your solemnization of marriage passing of those bills? Yes. And hold for yes. further study as well on uh, the vote on the bills we're hearing this evening. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Thank to you. Okay. The next bill we're going to, um, to hear is Senate Bill Number 246 by Senator Acosta, an act relating to health and safety, non-discrimination, and access to anatomical gifts and Organ Transplant Act, Isaac's Law. I believe we have Senator Acosta uh, with us now. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to my colleagues on the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, for hearing this bill and considering it today. I, I want to introduce the bill via its namesake, a, a, a young man who has spoke about in session on the floor recently when we were celebrating uh, Congenital Heart Disease Awareness Month, uh, Isaac David Upeck, after whom the, the bill is named. So uh, Isaac, as I had said on the floor, was born in 2004. He was born with Down syndrome and before his first birthday underwent open heart surgery. Um, just a week after his first birthday, his, his brother, Nicholas Heido Upeck, was born. And they are now both high school students in North Providence High School. And my cousin, my younger cousin reached out to me when I was first elected to this office to say, hey, listen, um, I've been doing some advocacy work around the rights of people with disabilities. And I noticed that Rhode Island is, is one of the states that has not codified or implemented a state level solution to ADA provisions that protect discrimination against people with disabilities from accessing organ transplants. I think that is wrong, and so I would like for you to sponsor and submit some, some legislation that addresses this gap. Um, and so that is the legislation that is before you today. Senate Bill 246, which has uh, nine sponsors on our chamber right across the aisle. It has a companion bill, House Bill uh, 6079, which also has nine folks signed on to that bill. And, and what the bill does, and, and I think the language is important here, is key, is, is that it prohibits discrimination solely on the basis of a person's disability. So it's not to say that you, this is in something that's part of a, a broader assessment for who is eligible for an organ transplant or not. All it is doing is saying you cannot be disqualified from going through the procedures of getting screened for one or actually getting an organ transplant uh, just because you have a disability as defined by the ADA. So as I mentioned before, it's, it's a simple state level solution to, to the ADA from the 90s that was revisited in 2008. Uh, the bill comes with support and input from the Autism Self-Advocacy Network and the National Down Syndrome Society. 16 states across the country have already passed some version of this bill. There's about a dozen that are considering it um, in this legislative calendar in addition to us. Um, and the disability definition, because it's something that comes up is whether we're trying to expand and broaden protections for folks. Uh, it is exactly and right from the ADA. So I, I will gladly take any questions, and I, I hope that this is something that this committee considers. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Senator. Any questions for Senator Acosta? Okay, seeing none at this time. I would like to take the next bill out of order, please. Um, I'd like to take uh, Senate Bill number 775 by Chair Miller. 
uh, he has to be somewhere. So, um, Sen uh, Chair Miller, if you would like to proceed on Senate Bill 775, an act relating to health and safety, Lila Manfield Sappensley Compassionate Care Act. You may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Coyne. Um, this doesn't take a whole lot of explanation. It's a bill that has been before you for several years. Um, it, uh, it's self-explanatory, and I know that many of you understand it. And um, both in this committee and uh, the health committee, um, who are very uh, aware of this type of legislation, um, both committees, the use of a personal story um, can be a double-edged sword. And I often avoid it because it, um, it, it's, it's, it's just not appropriate sometimes, but this is the type of legislation where everybody has a personal story and where um, a lot of the uh, issues around this go to how it, what we do traditionally without this legislation, that the intent of this legislation to assist in the end of life happens almost every day without this legislation. And why this legislation and this type of legislation is needed is because that process is arbitrary and based on tradition and religious belief rather than um, a common uh, platform that legislation appropriately gives those who are in these circumstances. And um, before I go to my personal story, um, this type of legislation and a lot of the concern with this type of legislation is about how it may or may not be abused. This type of legislation has been in place in Oregon for now uh, about 20 years. And it did not open a floodgate. Over 20 years in a much bigger state than Rhode Island, around 1,500 people have used that. That's less than 75 a year. So it does not open a floodgate. It's, it's, it's very specific and controlled, and that's what this type of legislation is meant to um, do. So to the personal story, and this is what most people think of is like you'll hear from people with uh, chronic conditions that they know are fatal and they want to plan and, and, and personalize how they're going to die. And um, this happened with my brother three years ago this week. And um, he died of cancer, which is one of the things that is traditionally understood that a patient can participate without law. And the troublesome part of this was that everybody understood, all his caretakers understood his wishes. But when it came to time to what is done Traditionally, without these type of laws, is people kind of turn up the volume on pain medication. And um, I think many of you have experienced this with either a loved one or another. And this, this type of law allows somebody to participate and regulate and have it clearly understood rather than culturally decided or decided without... Um, intervention and regulation and mediation of law. And so that happened with my brother. And what we had to do is settle between a series of doctors who had a wide difference in personal belief of where my brother was without um, referring to his beliefs rather than their beliefs. And that is really the issue, is that the patient's beliefs and the patient's orders will be directed and understood. Rather than arguing over whether my brother has met the threshold with three doctors of varying, not medical belief, but personal belief on whether he had reached that trigger. Where this kind of legislation would not leave it up to personal or cultural belief, but the patient's 
wishes based on the legislation. And I know there'll be, a, I think there's a, several people who this bill directly relates to on their own personal level and also um, legal uh, documentation on how well this type of legislation works to guide somebody's per personal preference on how they end their life rather than the intervention of our cultural situation or the personal situation of others rather than the patient and their family. Thank, thank you, Chair Miller. Does anybody have any committee members have any questions of Chair Miller? Madam Chair? Uh, yes, Senator Lombardi. And uh, I have, uh, if, if Josh would indulge me, Mr. Chairman, I, this, uh, this, week, uh, this weekend I have not had an original idea or thought in my head uh, so I'm in space somewhere, but I did receive uh, some emails from, uh, uh, not emails, but texts from some of my uh, more conservative uh, constituents in my district. And if you would indulge me, uh, and again, uh, these are just questions that will pop to me, Josh, if you just said, I know that this is extremely personal to you, and, and certainly uh, uh, I understand that. Uh, the first question that they ask is, would this bill allow a doctor who is not board certified in the underlying terminal condition to prescribe the life-ending drugs? No. Uh, and uh, this next question that they ask is, what efforts does this bill um, provide to prevent doctor shopping? So let me give you an example that they cite so you understand and put it in proper context. It says a patient with a long-standing relationship with his or her doctor who is treating the terminal disease could contact a doctor who supports the practice of uh, ending life. And that doctor could, after assessing the patient's medical history and current condition and conduct a physical exam, prescribe end-of-life drugs without consulting the doctor who has been treating the patient. Is that a fair reading of the statute? What I would want to do, and I know the bill's been hold for, held for further study, is get you some uh, casework based on the 1,500 cases over the last 20 years in Oregon. Okay, so we I have something it. actually very specific to refer to okay. and see if it aligns with our law to make sure that uh, those kind of concerns, um, if they're not addressed in the legislation as written, that they could be as best okay. we can. And I appreciate that. And the last question I have is, can you uh, somehow just uh, specify the drugs that they're using, Josh, for end-of-life decisions? Do you, do you know that as well, or is that something that we can... I think we can get some of the same data from the same source, and I, I don't think it's always the same based on patient to patient. And I would like just to say, you know, I know your characterization was some of your conservative members... This is legislation where I've heard from the full political spectrum and the full religious spectrum on people who support this uh, type of legislation or oppose it. It really doesn't have a political spectrum, and that's why it's been able to pass in states like Oregon is because it really doesn't have a political perspective. It has uh, the clarity of the intent rather than um, really a political leaning. Well, I, I, I can say to you, through the chair, of course, uh, I can say to you that it was certainly not anything I created this weekend. My head's been a little cloudy. and um, uh, But um, it was from a conservative group of constituents that, that I know. So these were happened to be uh, conservative inclinations. And I have a guest room if you need it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Any other committee members have any questions? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Miller, for joining us, and thank you for the explanation on the bill. Next up, we have, we're going to revert to Senate Bill Number 267 by Senator Valverde, an act relating to state affairs and government equality and abortion coverage. Senator Valverde. Thank you, Chair Coyne, um, colleagues on the committee. I, as uh, the chairwoman said, I am here to present Senate Bill 267, the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act. Um, as you can see, 267 is a very concise bill. It's only three pages long, but it's a very important bill for health equity in Rhode Island. 
Our current law targets thousands of Rhode Islanders to deny them access to health coverage for abortion. The legislation we are hearing today reverses that legacy of intentional discrimination and protects access to health care for state employees and their families, as well as those who are enrolled in Medicaid. I would like to thank you, Chair Coyne and Senators Oyer and Katsada, for your support and co-sponsorship of this legislation. In total, 21 out of 38, a majority of senators have co-sponsored this bill this year, and I hope to gain the support of the rest of this committee today. So this bill does two things. On page one to two, you'll see that it repeals the section of statute that bans the state health and state employee health plan from including coverage for abortion services. State employee health plans cover roughly 32,000 Rhode Islanders, including many of us participating in this hearing today. It includes health professionals, college professors and students, the public servants who make our state run every day, and it also covers their families. They deserve equal access to health care, including abortion. The second thing this bill does is provide coverage for abortion services in the state Medicaid program, the program that covers Rhode Island's most vulnerable populations. Um, it covers around 25% of Rhode Islanders, including 77,000 people of childbearing age. Medicaid is the public health coverage program used by low-income Rhode Islanders, people with disabilities, and current and former foster youth. They deserve equal access to health care, including abortion. Just two years ago, this General Assembly took action to protect the right of Rhode Islanders to make their own reproductive health care decisions without government interference. The Reproductive Privacy Act was a major step forward, but it left far too many people behind. Without access to coverage, reproductive rights are empty rhetoric. It's not a coincidence that this ban on health care coverage falls hardest on low-income Rhode Islanders and communities of color. That's how injustice works. Our current discriminatory state law follows in the footsteps of the Hyde Amendment, a rider that has been attached to the federal budget since 1977 and prohibits federal dollars from being used for abortion services. In 1976, Congressman Henry Hyde, the namesake of the funding ban, said during the floor debate, I would certainly like to prevent, if I could legally, anybody having an abortion, a rich woman, a middle-class woman, or a poor woman. Unfortunately, the only vehicle available is the HEW Medicaid bill. So there you have it. It was an openly discriminatory policy at the outset 40 years ago. If, if poor women are the only ones we can hurt, so be it. At least it's something. And that harmful legacy has caused the denial of care to thousands of pregnant people, ensuring that those who are already struggling fall deeper into poverty. The denial of Medicaid coverage for abortion care is one of the most concrete examples of the barriers to care that low-income people face when it comes to accessing the full range of health care, including reproductive health care. This means that people who are struggling most, disproportionately women of color, have to pull together what little funds they may have for an urgently needed health care procedure, even when that means skipping basic needs for themselves or their families. Or they have to continue with a pregnancy they do not want, are not ready for, or cannot afford. Given that 60% of women who seek abortion already have at least one child, this impacts not just the agency and needs of individuals, but also their families. We are not bound to perpetuate the extremism and narrow-mindedness of Henry Hyde. We can do better for the Rhode Islanders who have elected us to protect their rights and access to health care. Federal law allows states to decide if their Medicaid programs can cover abortion, and many do just that. Rhode Island should join the 16 other states who include abortion coverage in their Medicaid programs. We are surrounded by such states here in New England, including Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, Maine, and New York. When we passed the Reproductive Privacy Act in 2019, we said as a state that abortion is health care. We said that reproductive freedom is a right that should be protected in our state law. So today, we are not relitigating whether or not somebody has the right to an abortion. What we are talking about 
is making an established right, a right upheld by both the Supreme Court and this General Assembly, accessible to all. Because what good is a right if you are prevented from exercising it in your time of need? Many of the opponents to this bill are against it because just like Henry Hyde, they would like to ban legal abortion altogether. They have not been able to do that. So what is left is targeting the vulnerable. What is left is defending blatantly discriminate, discriminatory health coverage bans. What is left is distractions and disinformation. They'll say it will cost the state money. It won't, and they know it. These coverage bans have run counter to good health policy for decades, and it is time to end them. Let's stop deliberately discriminating against state workers and their families, against low-income people who use Medicaid. Let's stop interfering with their personal decision-making, with their health and well-being, and with their constitutionally protected right to a safe and legal medical procedure, just because they are the groups available to control. This bill is another important component of reproductive health equity, just like Senator Quetzada's Doula Reimbursement Act that this body has passed before and will hopefully pass again soon. Everyone should have access to safe, affordable reproductive health care. As we begin to emerge from this pandemic where health and economic disparities have been laid bare, we have an urgent obligation to enact health policies that break down barriers to care for low-income people, people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, the groups that continue to be denied access to high quality affordable care. As I said at the outset, this is not a long bill and it's not a complicated bill. It's very simple. Protecting the right to reproductive health care means protecting access to reproductive health care. And that's why the same passionate voices that spoke out so clearly in favor of the Reproductive Privacy Act are demanding that we take this next step. We will all continue to demand reproductive justice, not just for the privileged few, but for all. Not just for those who can afford it, but for all who need it. Not later, not someday, not after another long drawn out fight. We can fix this now, simply, and improve the lives of thousands of Rhode Islanders. So I hope this committee will support this bill and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank thank you, you, Senator. Yes, I believe Senator Rogers has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple points I want to bring up, and I don't want people to assume where my stance is on abortion because many people would be surprised on my opinion. Now, I have uh, looked into the Hyde, did a little research on uh, the 1977 Hyde Amendment, which uh, forbids the use of any federal funds and abortions except the three cases, which is life endangerment, rape, or incest. Now, that being said, there are some states that California and New York that allow this type of stuff. But my question is more, more of a financing thing. Uh, if this does pass or prior to passing, you know, in order to segregate uh, financing on this, it says in order to segregate funds on the states, plans that choose to offer coverage for abortions beyond high limitations must estimate the actual value of covering the abortions by taking into account the cost of the abortion benefit. And they cannot take into account any savings that might be gained as a result of the abortions. And also, the private marketplace plans that cover abortions, including enrollees that receive the federal subsidies, must collect two separate premium payments from all employees. One payment for the value of the value of abortion, and the benefit one payment from the value of the other services that were covered. So, uh, we've got a track record in the state of uh, kind of messing up. <laughs> some situations where we lose federal funding uh, that's tied to our Medicaid, uh, our, 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 our standard, and we failed on that. So uh, that's one concern I have. Uh, and my other concern is there's clearly a cost of this that's going to be borne by the taxpayers of Rhode Island. So on my, my issue, I'm, I'm questioning the finance of do we have estimates of what it's going to cost uh, and, you know, there's a part of this that I think should go through the financing committee because uh, that's pretty much an important part of this. So uh, those are my questions. Do we know what it's going to cost? And can we handle an additional burden that we failed in other areas uh, on our reporting uh, that has cost us dearly? So those are, maybe we ought to fix those things first before we add more weight to that problem. So that's thank, all I have. Thank you, Senator Rogers. <laughs> Senator Valverde. Yeah. 
Yes, um, so there has been a fiscal analysis done on this bill, and I believe Chair Coyne um, has it. Um, it does not um, negatively impact the budget. Um, and as for the, um, and that statement also says that it does not add any administrative costs to the state. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the, um, the contracted um, insurer that um, administers our uh, state employee health insurance plan. And so they would um, be administering the, uh, the additional, um, uh, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, paperwork on this. Uh, thank you. And we'll make sure committee members have that uh, fiscal report. Great. Uh, any other? Yes, Senator Rogers. Yeah, uh, our state employees or our Medicare recipients. Uh, like you said, of course, to our state employees. I was talking about the other ones that this will affect. Oh, so you're talking about the Medicaid portion? Yeah. So, like I said, it's, um, it's, it doesn't have a negative fiscal impact. I find that hard to believe if the taxpayers are going to be picking that up through the chair, that if the taxpayers are going to be picking up what the federal funds don't cover... I, I, I can't connect how it's not going to have a negative impact because it's going to have to come from the taxpayers to cover any of these abortions that don't hit the three marks of life endangerment, rape, or incest. It's going to mm -hmm. be borne by the taxpayers of Rhode Island because the federal funds of Medicare will not cover that. So that's the yeah. cost impact that I'm asking for. Yeah, but there are costs that are avoided as well. So, Senator Rogers, we'll make sure you get that fiscal impact study. Uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, comb through it yet. I got it very last minute. So we'll make sure that you get a copy of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes, Senator De La Cruz. I think I'm just going to follow up with uh, Senator Rogers had said, because the number was thrown out that about 32,000 people are on Medicaid. So they're presumably, we'll say, even just half of them are women. Um, uh, because I don't have those numbers, they weren't provided to me um, uh, with this testimony. So we can we can reasonably assume that this will cost the taxpayers. Um, so I'd love to see a fiscal note on that because I'm I'm going to assume that the doctors aren't going to perform these procedures out of the kindness of their heart. Um, so yeah, I would love to see the fiscal impact. Thank you. Yes, we'll make sure you receive it. Whip. Yes, go ahead, Senator Valverde. And uh, to be clear, that 32,000 was the number of state employees that are covered under the State Employee Health Insurance Plan. Nearly a quarter of Rhode Islanders are covered under Medicaid, including 77,000 uh, people of childbearing age. Thank you. Yes, Senator De La Cruz. I very much appreciate that um, clarification, Senator Valverde. So even more so, there would be a, a much higher cost to the taxpayer. So thank you for that clarification. Thanks. Thank you. Take, uh, I, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the fiscal note. Thank you. Any other questions for Senator Valverde? I know we have Rep. Kassa, who is also the House sponsor, who will be uh, who will be giving uh, testimony. Uh, are we all set with questions for Senator Valverde at this time? Thank you, Senator. Um, and I believe we have Rep. Kassa on the phone. Welcome to the committee, uh, Rep. Kassa. Uh, you are speaking today uh, on Senate Bill 267. You are the House bill sponsor on the same uh, piece of legislation. You may begin your testimony. Great. Thank you, Chairwoman Coyne and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak on this bill, the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act. Um, as the chairwoman said, I am sponsoring the companion bill, H5787, uh, with 25 co-sponsors in the House. I offer my comments while we're in the midst of the slow recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has spurred a tremendous amount of um, economic instability, disproportionately impacting women and communities of color. We as a legislator can, legislature can do our part to lift the barriers to abortion and to support reproductive, racial, and economic justice. This year has shown us that restrictions on access to health care intersect with unemployment, wage gaps, and deep inequities, which are denying some people the ability to make their health care choices with dignity and economic security. 
Access to reproductive health care, including abortion, is critical for exercising one's right to decide if and when to have children. Without coverage through an insurance plan, people must pay for health services out of pocket. Insurance coverage will prevent individuals from having to sacrifice basic necessities or incur debt to pay for procedures. Research shows that people who carry an unintended pregnancy to term because they're unable to afford an abortion that they seek are three times more likely to fall below the federal poverty line within two years. The out-of-pocket cost of an abortion could require a potentially catastrophic proportion of monthly income for many individuals and their families. The term catastrophic catastrophic health expenditure describes the out-of-pocket spending for a health service above a certain threshold of one's income. The proportion of households experiencing a catastrophic health expenditure within a specific time frame reflects how well a health system can protect households from financial hardship. In 2016, 75% of abortion patients in the United States were low income, and almost 50% earned incomes below the federal poverty level. Yet, in Rhode Island, we do not only create a barrier to abortion access for low-income individuals, we restrict abortion coverage, as you've heard, for all individuals through the state plan. A 2020 study of the cost of abortion across the U.S. found that the out-of-pocket cost for a procedure would have been catastrophic for households earning their state's median income. In 2018, about two out of every five U.S. adults were unable to cover any $400 emergency expense with cash, savings, or a credit card that they could pay off in the next statement. Pre-pandemic, the 2019 median income in Rhode Island was $32,256 per individual and $67,167 per household. Let's let that sink in for a minute. Half of Rhode Islanders in 2019 earned less than $32,256, which is roughly a $15 and change an hour. I also want to point out that across our state, our child care workers are paid approximately $12.01 an hour. So when we talk about our low-income workers without access to abortion, we truly are talking about many of the people that during this past year we deemed as essential workers. So imagine how much harder out-of-pocket expenses are hitting now in 2021 as a result of the economic blow of the pandemic. That means in order to pay any unwanted expense, people are forced to, go to forego food and other basic necessities to take out payday loans, delay or miss paying bills or rent, and relying heavily on credit cards and possibly pawning personal belongings. Finally, a research, research on the impact of carrying an unwanted pregnancy to term found that from six months to four and a half years after their mothers were unable to obtain abortion, the children had lower mean child development scores and were more likely to live in poverty. In Rhode Island, we pride ourselves in our sense of community, our independence, and our respect for each other's beliefs. We treasure our families, and we fight for justice. Let's finish the work of the Reproductive Privacy Act. Let's trust people and their health care providers to make their own health care and parenting choices according to their own beliefs. And most importantly of all, let's remove the risk of financial hardship that they will face with coverage of abortion services so that they will not, not at all ever have to experience catastrophic health expenditures and medical debt. I urge you all to bring the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act to a vote in this committee. This legislation is supported by the majority of our colleagues and the majority of Rhode Islanders. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Rep. Kazar. And before I ask if there are any questions, I see that Senator Rep. Takis is online, um, and I'd like him recorded as present. Would you also like to be recorded in the affirmative on any votes missed? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Representative Kassar at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for joining the committee uh, this evening, Representative. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we will now move to Senate Bill 645 by Whip De La Cruz. Whip. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this bill was um, really came came about in about 2019. Um, and so the bill is very straightforward. It's only a few lines. And under licensed healthcare facilities in the bill, um, A, the bill, the licensed healthcare facilities that are used to perform abortions shall meet the same licensing requirements as other similar healthcare facilities. B, the licensed healthcare facilities that are used to perform abortions shall be inspected yearly to ensure that they are compliant with all applicable laws and regulations. C, 
The Department of Health may conduct unannounced inspections of those licensed healthcare facilities to, that perform abortions. And D, any ex inspection that reveals a licensing um, requirement deficiency shall, in, uh, within the facility, will have its license revoked. Um, let me go to my notes here. Um, when uh, the, the abortion debate was happening in uh, 2019, it was discovered that there were zero inspections of Planned Parenthood. I had called the Department of Health and I had asked them for the past 10 years of reports. And the woman on the other line said to me, well, that's easy. There are none. Um, so that was quite shocking to find out that a facility that is performing um, these procedures isn't being held to the same standard as other healthcare facilities. Um, and I certainly wouldn't call that safe for women. This bill in no way whatsoever prohibits abortions and any naysayers uh, regarding this bill are, in, I would say, engaging in fear mongering if they attempt to paint this legislation anything other than it is, uh, which is intent to protect women. Fast food restaurants shouldn't be more sanitary than the clinics servicing our women. That's anti-women. So again, this has nothing to do with abortion. It really is about protecting women and making sure that they are um, afforded safe, uh, reliable health care. Thank you. Thank you, Senator De La Cruz. Any questions? Yes, uh, Senator Oyer. Um, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. I'm just curious um, what um, other doctors, facilities, uh, what inspections they get, um, outpatient facilities. It seems to me that there shouldn't be an extra burden for any, um, any facility doing any specific type of health care. Um, we should be having standards that serve through the Department of Health, um, all uh, facilities that do outpatient procedures. Um, and I, I also believe, and, and maybe the sponsor can clarify that, you know, any type of um, licensed healthcare facility can be subject to DOH inspection. I think, um, you know, I, I, so it's uh, some of the language in here and, and enabling the Department of Health to do unannounced inspections, I mean, I would, I would assume they already have that ability under the licensing standards that we already have for, um, for doctor's offices. Senator De La Cruz. That's great. Thank you so much, Senator Oyer. Uh, so the, the issue is that um, this, the uh, facilities that are performing uh, abortions for women in this state um, are not simply, this isn't the same as going to get, you know, some physical therapy or occupational therapy after, say, a car accident. Um, they're performing surgical procedures and uh, a lot of times using chemicals um, that, uh, that can be harmful uh, to the mother. Um, there have been instances where uh, patients have been um, taken by ambulance to Rhode Island Hospital from Planned Parenthood uh, because of complications arising uh, through the abortion. Um, I do agree that perhaps maybe we should have a standard across the uh, across the board for all facilities, but i um, happy to talk to you about that. But this is really about um, in a, women in a very vulnerable position, very difficult decision a lot of times for women. And we want to make sure that when they're walking in that um, we're protecting their health. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? Thank you. Seeing none at this time, we're going to move to the next bill, which is Senate Bill 664 by Senator Morgan, an act relating to Health and Safety Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Um, Senator De La Cruz, would you like to introduce that and explain that bill for us? Certainly. Thank you so much. Um, so every baby deserves a fighting chance, whether she's born in a state-of-the-art state hospital or an abortion clinic in a strip mall. A decent society can't turn its back on these babies because of compassion, truth, and because love still matters. This bill is, sim is really simple. It makes sure that newborn babies who survive an attempted abortion get the same care that any other baby would. Um, we, I think we all can agree that a baby shouldn't die on a gurney, on a cold gurney, without the assistance, simply because they weren't wanted, because that's inhumane. 
And I know that we would, I think, all assume that such care would be afforded to an infant born alive. However, uh, I believe in 2019, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam said, and I quote, and when it's born, speaking of a baby, an unwanted baby, we will make it. We will make the baby comfortable until the mother decides if she wants it to live or die. Um, to make an infant comfortable, whether the decision is made, is inhuman. I think everybody can agree with that. Um, unfortunately, also there are multiple eyewitness accounts from abortion facility staff involving born alive babies being murdered through strangulation fatal blows to the head, snipping of the, the spinal cord, and also even twisting of the necks. Former employees of infamous uh, abortionist Kermit Gosnell reported that he pervo- performed hundreds of snippings of um, the base of the skull of a born uh, alive infant, and the grand jury prior to his trial noted that it is without challenge that Kermit Gosnell, under the pretext of providing medical care, routinely killed viable babies. Again, this piece of legislation has nothing to do with uh, abortion, per, per prohibiting abortion. It simply um, provides the same level of care to infants born alive, regardless of whether they are wanted or not. I'm happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions at this time? I don't see any at this. Oh, yes, uh, Chair Oya. Um, this is this is just more of a, a comment rather than a, sure. a question. But, um, you know, we had a hearing a couple of weeks ago where there was the assertion that we needed to um, stick with what has happened in Rhode Island. And there was a very inflammatory case that was just referenced in Pennsylvania where that doctor was actually prosecuted. Um, under those laws because of, um, because of the actions that he performed. And I just don't think that Rhode Island should be um, basing their, their laws on uh, what happened in Pennsylvania, especially when what happened in Pennsylvania was actually illegal and that doctor was charged for it. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank, thank you, Chair Oyer. Yes, yeah, Senator De La Cruz. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair Oyer. I mean, uh, Chair Coyne, excuse me. Uh, I, I believe Senator Oyer is referencing the um, Second Amendment night uh, last Monday, a week ago. Um, so we removed the, the instance of Kermit Gosnell, and we just make it about Rhode Island, which is a fair point. Let's do that. Um, the, the fact still remains that children born alive, regardless of, um, regardless of their station in life or their parents' station in life, regardless if they're wanted or not, deserve the same protections uh, as you and I outside the womb. So uh, again, abortion or not, these individuals, these humans, uh, these babies deserve the protection. And I, I haven't met a person yet um, that disagrees with me that they should be afforded uh, every opportunity to live. So. Um, uh, again, I'm happy to take more questions. I think this one is a no-brainer, um, and hopefully we can all agree that babies deserve the best care. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any at this time. We'll move to the next one. I believe, um, Senator De La Cruz, you have the next one, 669, and an act relating to health and safety, Rhode Island Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Would you like to explain that? Thank you so much. Um, so I, again, uh, my first term as a, as a senator, uh, you know, I'm now in my second term, but my first term, um, I, was, I was at a, a family event and met an anesthesiologist at this uh, Burville family fun fair. And uh, I had asked her a couple of questions uh, and said, you know, if uh, an infant, a child inside the womb, are they able to feel pain uh, say if the mother is anesthetized. So, you know, the mom might be getting a procedure. And the anesthesiologist said that just because you um, anesthetize the, the mother, the infant can still feel inside the womb, depending on the age. Now, I know that uh, some, some studies will say that the, the infant can feel pain uh, at 20 weeks, maybe it's 25 weeks, maybe it's 18 weeks, maybe uh, it's eight weeks. There are several studies out there, but we, um, we want to make sure uh, that 
any infant that can feel pain uh, uh, is not um, subject to a, a horrific death. Um, every baby deserves a fighting chance. Um, I'll, hold on, let me just pull up my notes here. Sorry about that, the pain capable. Um, going to testimony given by uh, Dr. Kenwell Jeet, uh, a, a pediatrician at the University of Arkansas. He said, uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the Bush administration to defend the ban on partial birth abortion, explained that unborn uh, children have the ability to feel intense pain during an abortion procedure. Um, he also uh, stated that uh, it is severe and excruciating uh, the pain that children suffer as a fetus and uh, because the fetus is conscious during the ab abortion procedure. He explained that a baby shows increased heart rate, blood flow, hormone levels responding to the pain during the abortion, and a physiological response that is very clearly studied. Um, even though the fetus can't speak, uh, they're able to tell again by the blood flow and the, the, the heart increased heart rate and also recoiling from instruments inside the uterus. Um, then the summary of opinion, he explained that uh, human fetuses possess the ability to experience pain from 20 weeks gestation and on, if not earlier. Uh, the pain um, perceived by a fetus possibly is more intense than that of a term newborn or even older children because um, the highest density for pain receptors per square inch on the skin uh, in human development occurs in utero from 20 weeks to 30 weeks gestation. And since uh, infants have, or excuse me, uh, children in utero have um, um, uh, uh, their uh, their skin is not as um, as thick as as children outside of utero, um, they're able to feel again pain more intensely. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any on the committee. Any questions at this time? I see none. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Rogers, go ahead. These two bills that we just talked about, it's more of a statement. I would love to see these bills come to the floor. These certainly don't have a cost impact to the taxpayers of the state of Rhode Island. They're humane bills that I, I it would be incredible to me for, for anybody not to support these bills on the floor. It would be interesting to see these come out and how they were voted on. That's all I have for a statement. And I'm... Well, that's it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Senator. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. So that concludes the sponsor portion of our agenda this evening. At this time, we will now take testimony from the public. For those members of the public who are signed up to testify, if you would kindly state the bill number you are testifying on, especially if you're speaking on multiple bills. Uh, we do have... Um, somewhere around 100 or more witnesses this evening, so I anticipate it's going to take a while to get through our public uh, speaking portion. And uh, for the purposes of an equitable apportionment of time and resources, I'm going to ask that you keep, the public keeps their comments to no more than three and a half minutes, as we do want to accommodate all witnesses this evening. Um, and with that, I also want to let the committee know that we are going to um, uh, take 775, Senate Bill 775, before Senate Bill 267. We will go in order of the agenda. Uh, the first bill that we do have public testimony on is Senate Bill 126. And do we have the witnesses? Okay, great. So I believe the first witness we have the, of, from the public is Catherine Nordstrom. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the committee. Um, Ms. Nordstrom, you're speaking on Senate Bill 126, having to do with anatomical gifts. Uh, you must keep your comments to three and a half minutes, please, and you may proceed. Okay. All right. Thank you for, to the committee for allowing me to testify. I am testifying against Bill 126 because it is a well-intentioned but emphatically not a solution to the organ shortage problem and may actually harm vulnerable poor and minority Rhode Islanders while decreasing donations. I do have alternatives to suggest. Um, Bill 126 is a type of law called presumed consent or opt-out. These laws have failed in every U.S. state in which they've been proposed. 
supporters of these laws typically point to data showing that the majority of people in the U.S. are in favor of organ donation, yet only 54% actually sign up. It's a logical misstep to conclude that those people who approve of the idea are themselves willing to donate. If they wanted to, they would simply check yes on their license application in Rhode Island. So this kind of law illogically turns those who are undecided or who are unaware of the law into unwitting donors. And as Bill 126 is written, they may never know until it's too late. The heart symbol on every license would be removed, getting rid of perhaps the most significant way to notify residents that they are new, unsuspecting organ donors. Bill 126 is a major change to the social contract. To make this change as ethical as possible, Rhode Islanders should be currently digesting the possibility of this law. Yet, to my knowledge, not one sponsor of Bill 126 has discussed it publicly on any of their social media platforms. No news outlets have covered the bill on their behalf. This is not surprising. Legal scholars on this issue have said that the success of presumed consent relies on an unaware public. So Bill 126 so far will inevitably be in conflict with the ethics guidance from the American Medical Association, which says that donations under presumed consent would be ethically appropriate only if it could be determined that individuals were aware of the presumption that they were willing to donate and if effective and easily accessible mechanisms for documenting and honoring refusals to donate had been established. Will Rhode Island in eight months have the technology, staff, and system in place to make this law ethical by AMA standards when it took the state 40 years to upgrade its DMV computer system? Will a few signs be enough to make this law ethical? How will you reach all those people who have been retroactively deemed consent, and that is the way this bill is written, um, if, if they're not seeing those signs in the DMV? Um, consider that most organs that are actually donated are the result of motor vehicle accidents and that poor Americans are 4.3 times more likely to die from car accidents. Consider that black and Latino people in Rhode Island are overrepresented in the poverty statistics and that those groups are also statistically less likely to have wills upon death, much less organ declination cards. Um, can you imagine that that is going to increase, this kind of law will increase trust in the donation system. Um, keep in mind that currently there are lawsuits pending from plaintiffs in Massachusetts, California, and New York State demanding that donated organs cross state lines and that this is a part of a greater trend. Is Rhode Island willing to sacrifice the rights and grieving processes of its most vulnerable residents to fulfill the organ demands from wealthy and powerful states like New York and California that have some of the lowest donation rates in the U.S.? Even if that was all fine, it has to be pointed out that Bill 126 would likely also not work and could have harmful effects on donation. Up to date, peer review analysis has demonstrated no significant difference in deceased donations or solid organ transplant activity between opt-out versus opt-in country. What they do show is that these kinds of laws actually reduce living donation. If you take away that gift dynamic, living donation suffers. You cannot automate humanity. Um, finally, Mr. Uh, Senator Potter was talking about Spain, which has the highest rate of organ donation. But Spanish authorities frequently tell people who are researching this that their law does not contribute to their high rate of organ donation. It is a structural change that they made to their national donor service you must where they have coordinators in each hospital. Three and, and a half so, minutes is up. Ms. Nordstrom, okay. please finish up. I, could I have one more thing? If, if you remember one thing from my statement, consider that Rhode Island's most vulnerable residents, uh, ask yourself, if the state can't reach everyone who may want to opt in, which is the presumption of this bill, how could it possibly ethically suggest it can reach everyone who wants to opt out of organ donation? Under Bill 126, you will gain organs from people without their consent. That is inevitable. How many of these mistakes are ethically acceptable? Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions of this witness? Thank you for your testimony this afternoon. The next witness, please. Uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I believe it's Ms. Stern on the line from the ACLU of Rhode Island. You have three and a half minutes and you may begin your testimony. And you're on 126. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time this afternoon. Um, my name is Hannah Stern. I'm testifying on behalf of the ACLU of Rhode Island in opposition to this uh, piece of legislation. Our organization opposes just generally the imposition of opt-out processes because they just do not center the autonomy and choice and privacy of the individual in the way that opt-in processes do. Um, 
in this specific circumstance, that's the autonomy and privacy of those individuals who are getting a driver's license and just must choose whether to be an organ donor or not. We're especially concerned that for individuals for whom English is a second language or just for those who don't fully take in or read the signage or notification processes for opting out, that they could be unintentionally consenting to something that they just do not wish to consent to simply by not opting out. Uh, our organization actually successfully sued in 1990 on behalf of a Hmong family whose son was autopsied against their deeply held religious beliefs, which opposed desecration of dead bodies. And we're very concerned that this law could facilitate the occurrence of really more very serious scenarios similar to this. So we urge opposition to this legislation. Any organ donation education should be limited to just that, just to education, and should not effectively compel individuals to participate in this program. So thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions of this witness? I see none at this time. Thank you for joining us this evening. The next bill that we have testimony from the public on is going to be Senate Bill 775. Um, that is the Lila Manfield Sappinsley Compassionate Care Act. Do we have our first witness online? Good evening. Welcome to uh, the Committee on Judiciary. I believe we have Giuseppe Butera. Um, That's right. Yes, uh, you have three and a half minutes um, allowed for testimony. You may begin. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking my testimony. Um, I wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Providence Journal March 4th um, opposing legalization of assisted suicide. So I wanted to draw your attention first to that. And then uh, secondly, uh, since then, I've been thinking more about the bill, and, um, and, I, and I wanted to share this thought with you, and that is that for anyone who, uh, who is thinking that they could vote for this bill because it has supposed or so-called safeguards, uh, they need to, I think it's very important to look at uh, history and to see what has happened to uh, assisted suicide in places where you had safeguards uh, initially put in place. I'm Canadian. I come from uh, Ontario, and I've watched what's happened in Canada over the last five years. And in 2016, when the Supreme Court there uh, um, basically uh, legalized euthanasia, not just assisted suicide, but uh, euthanasia, uh, you've seen uh, things go from where the Parliament said that assisted suicide, you could have assisted suicide as long as, uh, as there were safeguards, and it can only be for the terminally ill, to when just a month or so ago they passed legislation which would legalize it for the non-terminally ill. And, you know, you can repeat that. That story is repeated in Europe, and, and, and there's no reason to believe it wouldn't be repeated here. So I think that if you're uh, uncomfortable enough with this as a suicide that you want safeguards on it, then uh, really the, 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 um, I think the most far, uh, 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 far-sighted, uh, um, uh, what would I say, uh, like strategy you could take is to oppose it now. Because if you don't oppose it now, then uh, a year or so or two years from now, you'll be faced with a bill that doesn't have those safeguards. But the same kinds of arguments are going to be made um, pressing you to, to pass it. And so you accept them now, don't accept them later. You put yourself in a very difficult position. Uh, so I think the time, so now is the best time to oppose assisted suicide. If you're at all concerned about it expanding and including people, you wouldn't want to see, um, have access to this, or even worse, be pressured into doing it. So that's, that's basically my testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Butera. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none at this time, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I believe our next witness is Ms. Nancy Poon. Um, welcome to the committee. Ms. Poon, you have three and a half minutes for testimony. You may begin. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all the Judiciary Committee members for allowing me to testify today. I am asking you to support the passage of Bill S-775. This is of great personal importance to me. My name is Nancy Poon, and I was diagnosed with ALS in December of 2018. Prior to my diagnosis, 
I was a marathoner, triathlete, cyclist, swimmer, yogi, and celebrated the joys of life with dancing. I am now living in a wheelchair with no use of my lower extremities. I am daily losing the strength in my arms and hands. The loss of the use of my hands and limbs will be followed by the loss of my ability to eat, swallow, speak, and lastly breathe. If I choose, I will be hooked up to a ventilator fed through a tube, all the while lying totally paralyzed. My most basic needs will be met by my caregivers. Cognitively, I will be the same person, but I will be living in an empty vessel. As much as ALS has changed my life, it has forever changed the life of my family. Their roles have changed from husband, son, and daughter to caregiver. ALS has taken an emotional toll on the entire family as we all await the end of this sad, devastating disease. As the end nears, I want the power to determine when I want to put an end to my suffering. I feel that I should be able to choose the time for the end of my life, one that reflects my personal beliefs and choices. End-of-life decisions should be health care decisions made by the patient. These decisions are far too personal to be decided by the state legislatures. I will know when it's time for me to say goodbye to my beautiful family and the wonderful life I have lived. I want the peace of mind knowing that my doctor can prescribe a medication for me so that I can softly leave this wonderful life. Passing Bill S-775 will allow me and all others living with deadly diseases to decide when we have had enough pain and suffering. Bill S-775 will allow me to die as everyone hopes to die, peacefully and with no more suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, very brave testimony. Uh, there just are no words, and I'm sorry about your condition. Um, do any committee members have any questions of this uh, witness at this time? I see none, and thank you again for, okay. uh, for your testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Next up, we have... Alan Poon. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Poon. Um, you have three and a half minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you allowing me to speak today in support of Bill S-775. You've already heard from my, my wife uh, of 42 years, Nancy, who was diagnosed with ALS in 2018. Uh, as many of you are aware, ALS, ALS is fatal. It has no cure, and its progression ravages the body inexorably bit by bit. As Nancy's physical condition steadily declines, I've taken on the role as her primary caregiver. It's not been easy to see such a vibrant, active, and strong person slowly lose so much of how she defined herself. However, as difficult as the past few years have been, we know what awaits us will be much worse. Nancy will lose the ability to use her arms and hands. She will lose the ability to eat, swallow, speak, and finally to breathe. She will be cognizant, yet totally paralyzed and kept alive by ventilators and feeding tubes. And I ask you all to try and visualize living in that state and to ask yourselves what decision you'd make if you had a choice to continue to exist like that or to choose another path. The key word here is choice. The bill before you enables terminally ill individuals to make informed choices regarding end-of-life decisions. It is a well-crafted, well-thought-out piece of legislation with critical safeguards that ensures patients with terminal disease like ALS can leave this world on their own terms with dignity, free from suffering, free from pain, free from anguish. It is one of the last things they will be able to control on their own, and they should have every right to do so. This bill has, a, has the support of, only, of not only Nancy and me, but also of our two wonderful adult children, Nancy's three sisters and her mother. 
Much of the opposition to this bill deals in hypotheticals and extreme potential abuses. Nancy and I are dealing with a harsh and painful reality. I can assure you all that increased levels of hospice care, pain management, and palliative care for someone languishing in the last stages of ALS provide little comfort or solace. As difficult as it is to imagine life without Nancy, the thought that we would be keeping her alive in such a state against her wishes would be even more unimaginable and unbearable. My family and I urge you to pass this incredibly caring, considerate, and humane legislation. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Do any committee members have any questions of Mr. Poon? I don't see any at this time. Thank you, sir, for taking time to testify this evening. Thanks again, Senator. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Welcome to the committee. I believe we have Peter Nightingale on the phone. That's correct. I'm Peter Nightingale, and uh, I'm from Kingston, Rhode Island. You Can have you three and a half minutes, sir. Excuse me? You have three and a half minutes for your testimony, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I won't need that much, but uh, thanks. Um, I'm calling to support the Compassionate Care Act. Um, it's because I've seen death. I've seen the death of my parents in their 90s. And my life experience is that we don't need outside interference in what is the ultimate civil liberty, namely the ultimate civil liberty to choose the time of our death. We certainly don't need interference from the state, nor do we need meddling by organized religion. There is only one matter related to the common good, and that is the prevention of abuse. For all these reasons, I think that the bill does that, the latter. So for all these reasons, I support this bill, and I urge you to do the same. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you any very much. For you, uh, thank you for your testimony. Does anyone have any questions from the committee? I don't see any at this time. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Welcome to the committee. I believe we have Miles Bidwell on the phone. Welcome to the committee. You have three and a half minutes for your testimony, sir. You may begin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting me be there. <coughs> um, I sent in a written testimony. I hope you've seen that. Yes, we have the we have written testimony, sir. All right. Um, I don't have much to add in, uh, in addition to that. I want to emphasize. Uh, the importance of options for end of life. I think that's hugely important. It makes the whole experience much better. Having someone else in control of end of life decisions seems to me a violation of <clears throat> basic, um, I think I said in there, natural rights as expressed in our Declaration of Independence. I told two stories that have had a impact on me. I remember when my dear mother was dying, she did not want to go to a hospital because she had had a friend of hers at 92 years old in a hospital. Her friend was clearly not going to live that much longer. Her friend fell out of bed and fractured her hip, and the hospital set about doing a very complicated operation to repair her hip. My, my mother was afraid of that happening to her. She did, um, near the end, tell me that I had shown compassion and mercy for my golden retriever when he was dying, and why couldn't I show the same compassion for my mother? Um, I couldn't then. Um, if I had any ability to, I, I would have. It's a terrible thing, and I don't think anyone should be forced into that situation. I'm hoping that your bill will prevent that for people in Rhode Island, and indeed possibly including myself. 
Um, my other story was simply on options. <clears throat> An uncle who was near death, who had lost his leg, and the hospital, this was France in the First War, left a pile of morphine and warned him that he took many of them, he wouldn't wake up. And he said he looked at that pile and he thought seriously and said, no, I'm going to stick it out another day and see if I can. I'll stick it out with this. And he did. And he said that he, if, if he hadn't had that option, he don't, that doesn't think he would have survived. Uh, that's, again, just a story that I think everyone in Rhode Island should be able to avoid being in that situation. And I'm, I'm grateful that your bill is before you, and I urge you to, um, to pass it. Thank I, I thank you for letting me speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Bidwell. Any questions of this witness? We don't have any questions for you at this time, sir. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you for having me. Next up, I believe we have Ms. Deb Stimson on the phone. Uh, welcome to the committee. You have three and a half minutes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, to community members, I am justifying in support of Senate Bill 775. I was uh, diagnosed with ALS in August of 2018. I am a, uh, a retired certified nurse midwife and an internationally board certified lactation consultant. I have cared for mothers and babies for over 40 years. I was also a former ICU nurse and very intimately aware of how to ventilate lasers function and the consequences of frequent suctioning, which is terrifying. I was also a clinical preceptor at the University of Rhode Island in McGriffey and a guest lecturer at Brown University in lactation. Having had the best of experience as an advanced clinical nurse practitioner, I knew when they told me I had ELS, I had a terminal diagnosis. I also knew that very moment that I would not be having any tracheotomy or ventilator or feeding. A death from ALS in this most extreme will feature a tracheotomy, a ventilator, and feeding to met the minimum. To be witness to the deterioration of my own body as I lose function in all limbs except my left hand and my voice to change to one that is no longer recognizable seems especially tragic. My voice can no longer teach. My hands can no longer help mothers birth and babies breastfeed. Nor can they hold my granddaughter or help my children. The journey of Ella is a complete shutdown of all motor activities and a complete antithesis of the embryology and the miracle I witnessed my entire career. That said, what about my family? We are very close to him. Each day for my children, husband, and myself is a day of never ending anticipatory grief. As we live our lives, roughly with the inevitability of my deterioration and death. When I was diagnosed, I didn't ask when I was going to die. I asked how, knowing it was going to be respiratory failure and suffocation. And I asked what my alternative was. Well, your alternative is to choose to starve and dehydrate. If this law is not passed in Rhode Island, it will do irreparable harm to people I love most in this world. It offers me a very sad and difficult end of my life. It is also counter to the belief that first, as medical providers, we do no harm. 
I believe that my body is just a vessel, a vehicle, a costume, a uniform to be able to live this life of service as directed my mind, our higher power, when my body can no longer serve that purpose. That's between me and that power, not legislative. As one voice in the choir of many, please, please, pass this spell. Allow all those items from a diagnosis to die with both dignity and grace. I, I thank you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. I know you're having difficulty speaking, but uh, your words and your emotion came through loud and clear. Do we have any questions of this witness? Seeing none at this time, thank you for taking the time to join okay. us this evening and for your testimony. Just a second. This is not a physician assisted suicide. This is the act of mercy. And please don't confuse the two if you decide you're both. Thank you. Thank you very much. That. Yes, thank you, Ms. Stimson. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. The next, um, the next witness. Ms. Clara Hardy is on the line. Welcome to the committee. Uh, you have three and a half minutes, ma'am, for testimony. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to the committee for allowing my testimony. Um, I'd like to especially thank the sponsors of this very important bill. My name is Clara Hardy, and I'm a resident of North Providence. I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 775, the Lila Manfield Sapinsley Compassionate Care Act. I am supporting this bill to honor my mother, who passed away last month, after having an amazing, successful, and happy 84 years of life. I am still in mourning for my mom and will be for some time as grief has no time frame. I'm here to say that my mom was lucky as she chose how she wanted to die. After a steady decline in both her mental and physical health and too many trips to the hospital, she chose to be in hospice care and was kept comfortable in her own bed at her assisted living facility until she passed on March 18th. But for some people, the dying process is long and often filled with suffering, not only for the person who is dying, but also for his or her family. Death is often feared because it is the unknown. So often we try to keep people alive by any means necessary, but in actuality, it is more humane to end their suffering when they no longer have any quality of life and the end is imminent. We actually do this for animals when they are suffering. When my dog became so debilitated that she was incontinent, blind, and barely able to walk, I made the decision to end her suffering, and while I held her in the comfort of her own home, the vet, the vet euthanized her, and her last moments were with me holding and kissing her. If only this peaceful and loving act could be replicated to humans so they can die with dignity in the arms of those that love them. For my mom who died on her terms and for those who wish to die on theirs, I strongly support Senate Bill 775 and say to those who oppose this bill based on the religious belief that only God should take away life, I quote from an article titled, I'm a, quish, I'm a Christian with stage four cancer. I want death with dignity. The author writes, quote, if God grants us the intelligence to enable doctors to offer treatments that prolong life, wouldn't that same logic apply to those of us nearing the end of our life? When science can't offer life-sustaining treatments anymore, then the role of medicine should be to relieve suffering, end quote. Distinguished Senators, you have the opportunity to allow people who are suffering and whose death is imminent to choose to die with dignity and to save the person and their family from the heartache of a prolonged death filled with pain and suffering. 
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of this witness? I don't see any at this, any at this time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hardy, for your testimony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up, I believe we have Dr. Catherine Mosley. Um, Doctor, you may begin your testimony. You have uh, three and a half minutes. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, senators and staff. As said, I'm Dr. Catherine Mosley, and I'm testifying against Senate Bill 0775. I'm the immediate past chair of the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs of the American Medical Association, also called CJA. CJA updates and maintains the Code of Medical Ethics, which has the force of law in a number of states. We discipline AMA members who violate the code in order to protect patients and the profession of medicine from unethical physician behavior. In 2016, the Medical Societies of Oregon and Washington State requested that the AMA change its prohibition against physician-assisted suicide into one of neutrality. The nine CJA members were equally divided, three in favor, three opposed, and three unsure. And you should note that all of our opinions are reached by consensus. We do not vote, and we do not have majority or minority reports. However, despite our apparent differences of opinion, we decided not to change our stance. Regardless of our personal beliefs, we decided that physician-assisted suicide, or PAS, is, and I'm quoting our AMA opinion now, is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer, would be difficult or impossible to control, and would pose serious societal risk. How we got to that opinion, I will now let you know about. We reviewed the laws throughout the United States and discovered that all of them were fundamentally flawed with respect to screening and treatment requirements for mental illness, protection against coercion, and standards for reporting to determine the prevalence of PAS. Internationally and in the United States, we found definition creep about determining terminal illness and age requirements. Throughout the U.S., we know that there is inadequate funding of and prevalence of hospice and palliative care. There's inadequate mental health funding and a paucity of mental health professionals. There's inadequate societal support for the disabled and their families. There is great public confusion about the differences between palliative care, hospice, euthanasia, and PAS, especially if PAS is called by any of its euphemisms like death with dignity or assisted dying. Legalizing PAS will likely increase minority suspicion of health care in general and physician motives specifically. Therefore, we came to the conclusion that the societal issues now are no different than the original opinion was rendered and, again, decided not to change our prohibition that PAS is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer, would be difficult or impossible to control, and would pose serious societal risk. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Do I have any questions for this witness? Yes, yeah, Senator De La Cruz has a question for you. Doctor, thank you for testifying today. Um, uh, you, you mentioned two things. Uh, that I, I'd like you to just touch a, a little bit more on uh, the protection against coercion. Could you uh, could you tell me a little bit more about that? And also, um, uh, I was curious to hear about uh, increased suspicion um, regarding health care uh, from individuals um, towards their health care providers. Certainly. As far as coercion, what we found in the laws that we reviewed was that there was no well, that people who might profit and benefit from the death of the person would also be allowed to sign as witnesses both to the request and to help, if you will, the person um, take the lethal drugs. And I believe your second question was a suspicion. Already we, there are studies that show that minorities, especially African Americans, are reluctant to go into hospice and so forth for fear that they will be given up on, for want of a better word. Um, and, and people do not understand 
the difference between hospice and palliative care, and then you throw physician-assisted suicide into the mix, and I'm just afraid people aren't going to want to do anything. We already see great vaccine suspicion, and that's not even a risk of dying at the hands of your doctor. So it's, it's clear that this is not certainly not going to increase trust in the healthcare profession among minority populations. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none at this time, thank you for your testimony this evening. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the committee. I believe it's Anita Cameron. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, welcome. You have three and a half minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Anita Cameron. I'm Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. Um, it's a national disability rights organization uh, opposed to assisted suicide. So I'm here to express opposition to S-775. Uh, there are many reasons to oppose this bill and others like it, and here are some. Number one. This bill puts disabled seniors and sick people in grave jeopardy. Doctors often make mistakes when determining people to be terminal. I know my mother was determined to be terminal, yet survived almost 12 years after that diagnosis. She passed away February 1st of this year. Um, number two, according to the Oregon report, uh, the top five reasons that people request assisted suicide, um, which is loss of autonomy, loss of the ability to do activities that brought pleasure, loss of dignity, loss of control of bodily functions, and feeling of being a burden are disability-related psychosocial issues that have not been effectively addressed not pain or fear of it as proponents claim. Number three, according to various reports, blacks in particular almost never request assisted suicide, especially if they're poor. And that's borne out in a Massachusetts referendum uh, results that show poor blacks and Latinas and whites voted overwhelmingly against assisted suicide in that state. In fact, around the nation, assisted suicide is requested almost entirely by wealthier, educated whites. So bills like S-775 are never safe. And rather than assisted suicide, people need effective treatment for their conditions and services and supports, along with options like psychotherapy, palliative care, and palliative sedation. Death should never be an option in health care. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of this witness? Seeing none at this time, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you.